Okay, so let's go on to the next um, page. Okay, so now let's talk about kind of, you know, an application uh, about this uh, stoichiometry we've been learning. So, the stoichiometry of the breathalyzer. So, um, in the 50s, um, the breathalyzer was developed for determining why an individual is, you know, driving while intoxicated or driving under the influence of alcohol. So the chemistry of the breathalyzer is actually pretty straightforward. Um, what it does, it, it takes ethanol, which is the first, so it takes ethanol here. Okay. And in the breathalyzer test, um, it, it contains like a, you know, a component or a compartment with the uh, dichromate ion. So the second term here, dichromate. And this reaction is catalyzed by acid. So what happens is your alcohol would be um, would be oxidized to what we call ethanoic acid or acetic acid. So it's basically acetic acid, and you get a chromium um, byproduct here, the chromium ion, and some water molecules. So how does this test work? Well, dichromate is yellow orange in color, and and chromium three plus is green in color. So this basically this color balance is, is what detects the amount of alcohol in the breath sample. And you know, they probably have some sort of uh, reading, uh, some, some device in there that can, that can um, actually um, tell you the alcohol content based on the uh, difference in color change. And that's what I'm going off of. I actually have never looked into this, but um, based on, you know, my chemical expertise and um, that's how I would envision that working so um, it's actually a pretty neat device for it it's just to detect the change in alcohol so a chemical reaction will react with alcohol and a certain amount of it will um, can be determined uh, by this device so the measurements are then um, converted into estimates of the concentration in the blood so it's a pretty crude um, crude determination, but it's a rough estimate. And, um, so, but it, it works well for its purpose. Um, so the assumption here is that, that, um, about 2,100 milliliters of air exhaled from the lungs, uh, contains the same amount of alcohol as one milliliter of blood. So that's kind of like the ratio we're going on. So, um, we can make a determination of the blood alcohol content um, based on these measurements. Okay, so measurements using a breathalyzer are reported in, in BAC or blood alcohol content or concentration from zero to 0.40 percent. So in most states here in the United States, uh, BAC of 0.08 percent is sufficient for a DWI conviction, and um, this is basically you have 80 milligrams or 0 0.08 grams of alcohol per 100 milliliter of blood. So um, it's been proven or maybe it's been shown um, that um, people who drive under um, this influence, uh, this pass or act or pass this content um, are mentally impaired um, from driving, uh, safely. So they make this kind of rule to, um, you know, as a safeguard, but, um, you know, whenever you drink too much, probably shouldn't be driving behind the wheel. I'm a designated driver, but, um, that's all I'll say about that. Okay. So here's an interesting tidbit. Some work with general chemistry students has revealed a common misconception. So some students believe they can cheat on a breath larger test by placing a copper penny in their mouth. Um, so, yeah, so they, they think they can um, get away with it. Um, that this would decrease the amount of alcohol in your breath and you can, you can uh, get away with a uh, 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 drinking alcohol, so it'll actually confuse the breathalyzer. However, um, 
maybe maybe the breathalyzer um, didn't work as well, so that may be one cause why this got got away, people got away with it. But um, copper metal is actually a catalyst, so it will actually catalyze the uh, reaction of ethanol uh, or um, the alcohol found in um, uh, what we know as alcohol for drinking. Um, it can be catalyzed by copper, and it'll partially oxidize it to <coughs> excuse me to um, acetaldehyde. So acetaldehyde is this molecule on the right. Okay, and then um, and it'll release hydrogen gas. So it can partially do that, but this reaction um, you you need to heat it. So. Um, I don't think this reaction will happen unless the copper penny or, you know, the copper is heated to a certain temperature. So it probably, probably won't work actually. So, um, so, um, that's a common misconception, uh, kind of folklore probably in, um, in, um, in the history of the breathalyzer. So, so yeah, so so metals do catalyze chemical reactions, um, but usually sometimes they they usually don't they don't usually catalyze them um, at normal temperatures. Usually you need to heat it, um, usually. But um, so that's a little tidbit about how we use these application stoichiometry to determine um, determine the concentration mm -hmm. of of certain chemicals. So. There's also always ways that we can apply this, and uh, that's what makes chemistry so interesting. It's a um, it's a science that you, you actually can see. Well, it's not the only science, but it's one of the sciences that you can actually see like the results of why we study this and why we learn this is so we can solve um, the world's problems as we do, as we um, evolve into a more advanced society over time. So like. Um, these common issues with like, you know, common like social social issues uh, are what made chemistry an important avenue for addressing them. But it's also to keep in mind, um, things shouldn't get too political where we stifle innovation or, you know, um, make things less accessible. So chemistry is, in my mind, uh, a way to open doors for a lot of futures. So if you're interested in chemistry or want to learn more about chemistry or like how my path to chemistry, just feel free to ask me. Okay. Well, anyway, um, we shouldn't um, get too sidetracked here. So these tidbits are just for your information only. Um, it's my way of integrating chemistry and the real world. So that's one of our learning objectives. So how can we apply chemistry? So I'll I always introduce these cool examples to show you um, why chemistry is the best science. Although that's kind of biased coming from me, okay? All right, so now we have to get to one of the more tricky aspects of stoichiometry, and that's called the limiting reactant and chemical yield. Okay, so remember the last example, we said we found 1.7 grams of ammonia to make three grams of nitrogen oxide by this chemical reaction. However, um, what, what the other thing that determines the rate of this or the outcome of this reaction is oxygen, right? So we also need something else, enough oxygen for the reaction to take place. So we need enough oxygen. If we don't have any oxygen and we just run this reaction without an atmosphere of oxygen, it won't do anything because the chemical reaction says oxygen is required to oxidize ammonia. So we can't um, do this reaction if there was no oxygen present. So here, look at this figure here. So here's this graph. So it shows us that for every, um, the grams of nitrogen oxide form is very much dependent on how much grams of oxygen are present initially at the start of the reaction. And you see here, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, right? If we take a look at the graph here, you see for every one gram of oxygen, we get this point in the middle here, and that's about um, 0.8 grams of nitrogen oxide. And we, and if we think about this in terms of moles, right, 
um, for every five moles of oxygen in our chemical equation, we only produce four moles of nitrogen oxide, roughly 0 0.8, right? It looks like 0 0.8 there. So you see there, so that um, they do, do kind of obey this chemical formula here. Okay. So at first we see the amounts, uh, the amount of NO produced is directly proportional to the amount of, um, of O2 present when the reaction begins. But you know, see as it slows down, as you add more oxygen, um, the rate actually, or the production um, produced, the amount of nitrogen oxide produced um, slowly kind of decreases until we get to a point where um, we get to a point where um, it plateaus, right? So in this case, the yield of uh, nitrogen oxide gets to a point where um, we uh, add O2, keep adding O2, but it doesn't give us any more product or nitrogen oxide form. And that's because one of the reactants is being consumed first. So eventually, if we add more oxygen, um, the ammonia is going to be consumed and then eventually there's no more ammonia. So then the reaction just stops and no more product is produced. So, and that's, um, and then that what determines how much yield we get or how much product we can get out of this reaction given the initial conditions. So the conclusion is we cannot get more than three grams of NO from 1.70 grams of ammonia. So this point here represents 3.0 grams of ammonia of nitrogen oxide. And here uh, we're saying as we increase oxygen past the point of excess, we can only get three grams of nitrogen oxide. Okay. So that's how much uh, nitrogen oxide we can produce. So therefore, if we keep adding oxygen here, and we know we had initially three grams of ammonia, that means ammonia is our limiting reagent because it gets consumed first. And as we add more oxygen, eventually we stop producing nitrogen oxide. And we say oxygen is the in excess and is the excess reagent. Okay, so let's use an analogy here to, um, to demonstrate um, a limiting reactant, a reagent, okay? So for example, imagine you're building a bed frame or a TV stand, right? It usually comes with a set number of bolts and nuts um, to assemble and make secure the bed frame or TV stand. So usually you have uh, the right number of nuts and bolts. If you don't, um, you can't securely make the TV stand or bed frame, so it's going to be an incomplete product. So, um, so it's like an incomplete reaction, right? You don't, you don't, uh, make the, you, uh, eventually, um, make less product than you, you thought you would. Okay. So imagine we want to make 10 NB molecules, which require one nut and one bolt to assemble. So if we have an equal number of them, 10 nuts and 10 bolts, we can make 10 NB molecules. Okay. Now, if we are trying to make a molecule that, like N2B, which has two nuts and one bolt per molecule, only five of them can be made because for every bolt, we require two nuts. And if we go down to our scheme here, we see that the total number of molecules, we can only make five of them. And, that, and, that, and at the end, there will be an excess of bolts. So in this case, the nuts in this uh, in this problem or example is the limiting reagent. Okay, so it's kind of thinking about you know that pancake example at the beginning. Oh, we can only make this many pancakes because we only have this many eggs. Uh, or another example here, using um, you know our example of with assembling furniture because once we work out uh, of nuts and bolts. Um, we can't make any more um, 
any more furniture or beds, right? So uh, we'll be in, we'll be in a, a pretty difficult situation. Okay, so that's that's kind of what a limiting reactant is. Like it causes your end product to reach a limit or quota of production. So you can only make a certain number of them given how much starting materials you have, right? So you don't have much starting materials to make a house, right? You need to order more or else you can't finish the house. So it's sort of like this. Okay. So let's try another example similar to a chemistry problem here. Okay. All right. So imagine we want to assemble as many N2B molecules as possible. We have a collection of 30 nuts and 20 bolts. From the formula, you know, from N2B, we can tell that for every bolt, we need two nuts. So there are three ways to approach this problem and find the limiting reactant. So first, let's go over this one. So determine the number of nuts required to combine with 20 bolts. So we have our, so our, uh, our factors here is one bolt. For two nuts or the opposite two nuts per one bolt okay so we have 20 bolts right how many nuts do we need to combine with 20 bolts so um, we want to end up with nuts right that's the question that's our question so we have one bolt per two nuts so we will need 40 nuts here. Okay, so we will need 40 nuts. So this is the amount we need, 40 uh, nuts needed. So we should write, we need this amount to combine with 20 bolts. Okay. So, but if we look at our, um, if we look at our, the question in more detail, only 20 nuts are so only 30 nuts are available. Right? So only 30 nuts are available, right? So 30 is less than 40, so nuts must be the limiting reagent. So nuts is the limiting reagent. because we don't have enough nuts to react with 20 bolts. Therefore, um, by comparison, nuts are the limiting reagent. Okay, so that's the first method. Second method, let's determine the number of bolts required to combine with 30 nuts, okay? So in this case, we're going to use the opposite fraction that we just used. So we're going to use one bolt is equal to two nuts. And then we get um, 15 bolts. So we need 15 bolts needed to combine with 30 nuts, okay? So we have 20 bolts though. So if we go back to our previous example, we have 20 bolts, so we have 20 bolts. And we know that we, this means we have an excess of bolts, right? So we have an excess of bolts. So 20 bolts, excess. So we have an excess of bolts. So by default, this means um, this is not the limiting reagent. So our conclusion is not the limiting reagent. Okay. So the other example, we the other method, the last method we can do, and the one I really like to highlight <coughs> is we can determine the number of molecules that can be made from both nuts and bolts. So we know that, um, so for every N2B molecule, right? It requires two nuts 
and one bolt, comma, one bolt. So for this um, equation here, for dirty nuts, we're going to say we need two nuts per one NB, N2B molecule. So one N2B molecule. Okay? So in this case, we can only produce 15 N2B molecules. Okay, and then in the example for bolts, we know that for every N2B molecule, there's only one B in the formula. So it's going to be one N2B molecule requires one bolt. So this means we can produce 20 N2B molecules. But that's assuming we have an excess of nuts. So we see here that the nuts produce less product, right? So here we have less product, less product, or less product, less N2B molecules. Right, so less product, less NTB molecules. So this is the limiting reagent, limiting reagent. Okay, so this is going to be the limiting reagent. Okay, so there's three methods. You can calculate how many molecules a certain reagent can make given the initial amount of each reagent or reactant. Or you can calculate um, the number of the other reagent that is needed to completely react with the with the other reactant. Okay, and um, I, I I thought one and two were pretty good methods when I was learning it, but I think number three is the most popular. Even though you have to do a little bit more work, um, I think it's clear that the the um, the starting amount of the reactant that produces the least amount of product will control your reaction. So therefore, that is the limiting reaction, limiting reagent. So once you hit 15 N2B molecules, there's no more nuts uh, to do a f to produce more product. So it's kind of like a factory line, right? Um, if you don't have enough nuts, you you can't assemble maybe assemble a machine, right? So once you run out, you halt production. So it's kind of similar to here. Okay, so in the next example, we'll go over um, um, we'll go over uh, 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 exercise given the limiting reagent. Okay, so see you then.